I haven't been feeling the greatest lately. I recently watched Bo Burnham's Inside, and it really got to me. You know, the whole slow and inevitable death of the world thing has kind of been getting me down. So instead of talking about evil legislators trying to take medicine out of the hands of children, I thought I'd do something a little more lighthearted this week. I'm going to talk about a movie, and it's been a while since I've done that, yeah? And Jesus forgive me, I'm going to watch some comfort food Disney cartoon. It's Wally. <laughs> As far as Pixar movies go, Wally has always had a special place in my heart. It came out in 2008, so I would have been 16 or 17 when I first saw it. Not so old that I was too cool for Pixar, but not too young to get it. And Wally is one of those films that always comes up in a sound design for film class. The film's sound designer was Ben Burt, who also voiced Wally. Ben Burt is best known as the sound designer for Star Wars and Indiana Jones. He's responsible for all the pew pews and vrrrms and ah. Something new for us also at Pixar that we had a sound designer in-house on a film before post, you know? A film led by a sound designer has a lot of potential, and Wally lives up to that potential. The first half of the movie is made up of two robots who can really only say their own names. There's very little dialogue until about 40 minutes in. For a kids movie, that's a pretty bold sound design choice. So let's talk about Wally, -E, and hopefully it'll help us feel better about the impending end of the world. Evacuations are underway as a meteor heads toward the metro area. Go, 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 go! The all-new Volkswagen Tiguan. It fits everything you need and everything you don't. Wally -E is the story of. Wally, -E, a robot whose prime directive is to turn trash into bricks and build those bricks into towers. As far as we can tell, Wally -E and his pet cockroach are the only living things left on Earth. Until one day, a much more futuristic looking ship lands on Earth and dispatches a floating orb type robot. This robot is called Eve, and the two become fast friends, even though they're robots. How cute. In an effort to impress Eve, Wally presents her with a plant he found among the rubble. Eve takes the plant, puts it in her robot body, and basically just shuts down. Eve's ship returns to Earth to pick her up, and Wally hitches along for a space adventure until their return to the Axiom, the human race's mothership. Just, just look at how pretty this movie is. We learn that this ship left Earth in the year 2105 and has been cruising through outer space for the past seven centuries. Oh, hey, I see the ship's log is showing that today is our 700th anniversary of our five-year cruise. Well, I'm sure our forefathers would be proud to know that 700 years later we'd be doing the exact same thing they were doing. All while the EVE probes have been searching the galaxy or space or whatever, for planets that can sustain life. And this whole time, humans have become stuck in this brave new world lifestyle of unlimited food and entertainment while floating around in their hover chairs. Once Wally and Eve get on the ship, this is when the movie's main conflict is revealed. Got some bad news. Um, Operation Cleanup has, well, uh, failed. Wouldn't you know, rising toxicity levels have made life unsustainable on Earth. Unsustainable? What? Turns out, Operation Cleanup was abandoned after only five years, and with it, any hope of returning to Earth. Control of the Axiom was given over to the ship's artificial intelligence, and that control has lasted for the past 700 years. So in order to maintain this weird, hedonistic homeostasis for the humans on the... 
Haxium. The onboard robots work together to sabotage the EVE program and destroy the Earth plant. But this whole struggle doesn't last very long, because the ship's captain, Wally, Eve, and the passengers all work together to fight against the ship's AI, and they successfully get the ship to head back home. And the entire recolonization of the planet takes place during the end credits to the dulcet tones of Peter Gabriel. It's a beautiful ending and a fitting resolution for the sad state of humanity in 2810. When Wally first starts, we've got an Earth that has been completely ruined by humans. And now all the humans are just stuck, flying through space in their hover chairs, being waited on hand and foot by robots whose only directive is to keep them subservient. Pretty classic dystopia stuff. But is it? Every structure that we see in this movie is owned by a corporation called By and Large. There's a superstore, a gas station, a bank, a railway system, ocean liners, even the Axiom ship itself. And both Eve and Wally were created by this company. As far as we can tell, By and Large basically runs the world. The CEO is called the Global CEO, and whenever we see him, he's standing in what is basically the White House press room. So imagine, if you will, in 80 years, if Amazon and Walmart and Google and SpaceX all merge together and that mega conglomerate becomes as powerful as any nation state has ever been. For a delicate little socialist like me, this is a nightmare scenario. Imagine if Elon Musk had all the power of Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and the US president rolled all into one dystopia. But if future Musk, Bezos, Gates were in this position, do we really think he'd send humans out on a five-year space cruise while he stays behind and cleans up the Earth? Yeah, want to go. I, I mean, honestly, a bunch of people probably will die in the beginning. It's, yeah. it's tough sledding over there. You know? And the humans on the ship, yeah, they do live in this brave new world situation, but there's no evidence that they're being drugged or controlled or anything. The second their screens shut off, they're wide-eyed with wonder. The humans, after 700 years, are still curious. Just the dirt from Eve's plant is enough to inspire the captain to ask Sigourney Weaver's voice all about the earth and the sea and plants and dancing. Dancing, a series of movements involving two partners where speed and rhythm match harmoniously awesome. with music. I guess it's pretty bad that the ship's mission lasted 700 years longer than it was supposed to, but the whole mission was leave Earth until Earth can sustain life again. And once Eve brings the plant to the ship, the ship heads back home, after some light combat scenes. And yeah, there does seem to be a dearth of art and literature and research during these seven centuries, but the people are alive. The ship was only supposed to be in space for five years, but it has managed to keep humans alive for 25 generations. Mechanical systems. Unchanged. Reactor core temperature. Unchanged. Passenger count. Unchanged. Regenerative food buffet. Unchanged. I gotta say, as far as dystopias go, we live comfortably for 700 years until we're able to fix the planet? Not so bad. Wally, the movie, tries to describe a dystopia, but all we get are the aesthetics of dystopia. The people on the Axiom aren't really living their life, but is that so bad? No one seems particularly unhappy or exploited. Granted, the kids are taught some messed up capitalist propaganda, but that's really no worse than what we've got today. But seriously, I can't wait to work. I can't wait to really work, to have a job. It's like we all decided to go on vacation for a few centuries with universal education, healthcare, housing, all managed by a sophisticated AI. And the minute we're ready to go back to Earth, we can just kick the AI's ass, even if our bones have been getting less dense from the low gravity. This is a utopia. When you're ready to speak to someone in another language, press and hold the earbud and speak in your native language. Good afternoon. What are the menu specials today? Buenas tardes. ¿Cuáles son los especiales del menú hoy? 
Now, let's compare WALL-E to a theoretical sci-fi script. Let's call it Movie X. Movie X is about a global pandemic, but not the kind that melts your brain or eats your skin or whatever. Just a really intense flu. And the world economy comes to a screeching halt, and millions of people are dead from the disease after only a year. But luckily for us, in record time, there's a vaccine. An entirely new type of vaccine developed faster than any other vaccine before it. And so companies start giving away beer and donuts and even weed if you can prove you're vaccinated. And some places even start giving away million dollar jackpots to people just for getting that vaccine. But enough people refuse to get the vaccine so that there's no herd immunity. And then a new variant of the virus appears that's more transmissible and more deadly, but it really only affects those who haven't been vaccinated. Which means it's going to do the most damage among unhoused people, children, and the global south. I don't know about you, but that sounds way worse than living your whole life on a pleasure cruise through space. But is it dystopian? I mean, even though the reality we're living through is way, 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 way worse than what we see in WALL-E, it's strange to describe your own reality as dystopian. And for me, I think part of that is the implication that dystopias must be in the future. Like, a past dystopia doesn't feel dystopian because you know there's some potential for improvement, right? That may be a broad generalization, but I needed to make it to get to the next point. We are living in the future. With the S-Ring, you can answer phone calls without having to pull out your mobile from your pocket, or even when your phone is at some distance, and keep your conversations private without others overhearing you. When I was a young genderless child, I watched the seminal classic Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion. In this movie, there's a flash-forward sequence that takes place in the year 2067, the future. And looking back, this is all very low-tech for the 2060s. But I remember this video phone device vividly, and that to me was the marker of the future. When we have devices on our kitchen counters that exist primarily for video calls, that means we're in the future. And we've got those. But also we're carrying around most of human knowledge in our pockets. And we've got voice-controlled robots in our house that can turn on the lights or lock the doors. And you can get basically anything delivered to your house on demand. And we've got virtually any movie, TV show, book, or song available at the touch of a button. Burgers are made from plants. Smoking is digital. And we're flying helicopters on Mars. Also, no joke, when I was looking up videos of this helicopter in flight, I got an ad for Amazon Pharmacy. And although we're living in the science fiction future of million dollar vaccine incentives, none of these technological advances are scary on their own. Well, maybe they are scary, but why? It's because we know how anything even remotely innovative and forward-thinking and good for humanity will be corrupted by the free market. Let's say I want food. We all eat food, yeah? Well, let's say I want food, but I'm disabled, or I take care of another person, or I don't have a car, or I just want food. I can pull out my phone right now and just get a whole grocery trip done on a single app without talking to a single human. And that's awesome. It makes food more accessible, and that's a net good. But I have to use this mass-produced phone, which is made up of rare earth minerals, which are mined and produced by underpaid workers in unsafe conditions. And to even get access to the internet, chances are I'm paying a premium to some telecom monopoly. And the person who's actually doing the shopping, well, they don't have labor protections or health care, despite being a crucial part of feeding me and my family. If you zoom in real tight, yeah, it's awesome that I can order my groceries with a few taps on my phone. That's so much better for so many people than things were even 20 years ago. But when you look at the big picture, that's when the dystopia sets in. In WALL-E, once it's determined that the Earth is unlivable, the solution is to stay the course. 
the ship is just going to keep moving forward until the eventual extinction of the human race. Just stay the course. Um, rather than try and fix this problem, it'll just be easier for everyone to remain in space. Easier? That's what's so scary about Wally. We know this ship won't last forever, and yet everyone's just going about their normal business. And doesn't that hit a little close to home? I mean, we just got out of once-in-a-century worldwide disaster, and now everyone's all, come dance the night away, two dollars off margaritas. And I don't even know if I can blame this attitude. I mean, we all know what's around the corner. Might as well live it up while we can. Might as well make video essays about Pixar movies that came out when I was in high school. And so the wheels of commerce never stop turning, even when they're headed at breakneck speed toward the end of human civilization as we know it. I'm glad I watched Wally. I feel much better. So, what did we learn? It's it's kind of silly to be scared of the future, isn't it? Like the future is going to happen whether we want it to or not, and if we're going by Romy and Michelle rules, we're well into the future. And we should be glad for the internet and plant-based meats and even the state offering a million dollars just for getting the vaccine for a virus that has already killed millions. Even if it is all absurd and surreal and futuristic. But again, technology isn't what's so bad about dystopia. So many metrics are improving. Life expectancy is as high as it's ever been. And that's always kind of been a pretty good way to quantify quality of life in general. But life expectancy is really just how long people survive. And I don't want to survive. I want to live. I don't want to survive. I want to live. Future dystopias aren't scary simply because we've progressed into the future, but because despite that progress, life is so much worse for so many. So despite how good we seem to be doing on paper, I can't help but feel like we're moving backward. And that's what dystopia is. It's a failure to realize our potential as the human species. And what can we really do about it except just stay floating on our hover chairs waiting for the ship to fail? <laughs>